Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here today. So I'm proud, or, uh, proud to present Breaking Barriers, Empowering Newcomers with Open Banking in Canada. So just a few housekeeping items before we get started here. Uh, throughout the pr presentation today, uh, it'll last about 50 to 60 minutes in duration. Uh, there's a Q&A at the bottom. Feel free to type your questions as we go, uh, but all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. So the purpose of today's workshop uh, is to learn about the financial system in Canada and the challenges that newcomers face in various sectors, such as housing, insurance, and banking. We will introduce you to the concept of open banking and discuss how it is currently being utilized globally. Last, we will discuss how now is the perfect time to disrupt the financial system in Canada and how open banking can be the solution to help newcomers access the products and services they need to be successful. I have with me today multiple industry experts. So I have Tyler Adams from Blackline Property Management. Tyler is uh, the head of operations at Blackline, a third party property management company based out of Waterloo, Ontario. Prior to this role, Tyler spent time in leasing and mortgages where he saw firsthand the need for better tools to help screen newcomers equitably. Nigel from Neo Financial. Nigel is a former founder, entrepreneur, and innovative strategist. Nigel leads the corporate development and strategy at Neo Financial. In his current role, Nigel is responsible for identifying new markets and opportunities to rapidly grow the impact and footprint of Neo and its financial services offerings here in Canada. And last but not least, I have Eric Lapointe from Single Key. So Eric is a seasoned entrepreneur with extensive knowledge in commercialization. He started his career in hospitality and began his entrepreneurship journey during his MBA at the Ivy Business School. He is now a part of the leadership team at Single Key, where he is responsible for new commercialization strategies and growth. So we're gonna start by talking about the Canadian financial sector. So we're gonna to touch on, um, well, the Canadian financial system is a crucial aspect of our country's economy to begin with. It provides Canadians with access to tools and resources necessary for financial stability and growth. However, the current financial system in Canada is not without its flaws, particularly for newcomers. There are significant issues that affect the ability of newcomers to access the products and services they need upon arrival in Canada. For the purpose of today's discussion, we will focus on accessibility, discrimination and bias, as well as affordability, which are the three main barriers to entry that newcomers, to, newcomers experience when trying to secure basic financial needs. The good news is, Today's discussion will also explore potential solutions to these issues, highlighting the need for a more inclusive and equitable financial system for all Canadians, regardless of their tenure here in the country. So let's start by talking about accessibility. The lack of accessibility in the, in the Canadian financial system is a major flaw that affects not only newcomers, but also many Canadians, particularly those living in remote areas or low-income households. For those living in low-income households, they experience many problems, such as not having the financial resources to meet minimum balance requirements or to pay fees associated with certain financial products, such as bank accounts, credit cards, and bank drafts. Additionally, barriers might include lack of financial literacy, meaning these individuals have limited knowledge about the financial products and services that are available to them, making it difficult to make informed decisions about managing their money. Lack of and or poor credit history, which can make it def difficult for them to access credit cards and loans. Lack of identification, which means they may not have necessary identification documents required to open a bank account or to access other financial services. And lastly, physical presence. Many financial institutions require this, which can be a challenge for those living in rural areas or small towns with limited access to bank branches. Discrimination and bias are significant flaws that the Canadian financial system that affects the Canadian financial system, particularly for newcomers. Discrimination can take many forms, including higher fees, lower credit limits, or outright denial of financial services. A few examples of this are auto insurance and credit cards. Oftentimes, oftentimes newcomers' driving records from their home country are not recognized by insurance providers here in Canada so they're forced to pay two to three times higher premiums. 
When it comes to credit cards, newcomers are often appro approved for secured cards, meaning they have to put up collateral in the form of cash or securities in order to be approved, or they are approved for much lower unsecured credit limits. This is due to a lack of established credit history here in Canada. Some financial institutions may discriminate against newcomers based on their country of origin, race, or socioeconomic status. An example of discrimination by financial institutions could be a scenario where a person who has recently immigrated to Canada applies for a loan at a bank. Despite having a good credit score and stable income in their home country, the bank denies the loan application solely because the individual's country of origin and the fact that they have no established credit history here in Canada. The bank may assume that the person is a high-risk borrower due to their lack of credit history in Canada even though the individual has no prior history of defaulting on loans or credit payments in the home country or Canada. This is an example of discrimination based on a person's country of origin or immigration status, which can have a negative impact on their financial stability and opportunities here domestically. This can be especially problematic for those who have recently immigrated to Canada and are trying to establish themselves in a new country. This is a prime example of the chicken and the egg problem, very similar to trying to secure your first job, where employers are looking for work experience and you're looking for your first job so that you can build that work experience. Addressing these flaws requires a multifaceted approach, including policy changes, increased financial education, and cultural sensitivity training for financial institutions. By addressing these flaws, Canada can create a more inclusive and equitable financial system that benefits all Canadians, including newcomers. So we touched on a few of these, or I'm sorry, in regards to affordability, we touched on a couple of these uh, features in the accessibility component, but I wanted to dive a little deeper and showcase an example of exactly what I mean, specifically about not having the resources available to meet the minimum balance requirements. What you're seeing now is an example of how it can be, or sorry, is an example of how expensive it can be to hold a bank account in Canada. This image highlights three separate tiers of checking accounts that are offered by a financial institution here. As you can see, the more usage and the benefits that are included, the higher the monthly fee and the higher the minimum balance requirement in order to waive that monthly fee. In addition, or sorry, in, in, in an environment where the cost of living is at an all-time high here in Canada, 54% of Canadians say they are now living paycheck to paycheck as the cost of living crisis continues to squeeze budgets, which means there is a very high probability that those individuals will not have the funds to maintain a monthly minimum balance of say $3,000 or $5,000. So what this essentially means is that with each one of these accounts based on the tier that you have, if you maintain a minimum account balance of $3,000 uh, close of business day every day for the entire month, they will waive that checking account fee for you. So on and so forth with the unlimited account and the all-inclusive account where the minimum balance requirements are 4,000 and 5,000 respectively. Now, the bright side of this is that we're starting to see multiple players uh, emerge in the market, primarily challenger banks and neo banks that are offering free checking accounts, unlimited transactions, and no minimum balance requirements. However, neo banks or challenger banks also come with their challenges, such as limited product offering, lack of physical presence, and reliance upon technology. I know Nigel from Neo Financial is excited to be here today and to explain how they are making banking more accessible for all Canadians, regardless of tenure. Newcomers to Canada face several challenges when it comes to finding adequate housing, securing insurance, and accessing banking products and services. These challenges can be particularly daunting for those who are unfamiliar with the Canadian financial system and its requirements. Here are some common difficulties that newcomers might experience after relocating to Canada. Housing. When it comes to rental applications, newcomers might face difficulty in providing the necessary documentation required to complete rental applications such as credit history, rental history, employment information, as well as domestic references. They have limited options. There's limited rental availability in certain cities, high rental costs and language barriers can also make finding suitable housing challenging. Canada is currently facing a supply shortage. When it comes to rental housing, vacancy rates are less than 2% across the country, which fosters a highly competitive environment. 
newcomers are also forced to compete at a disadvantage against multiple domestic applicants with Canadian credit history, references, employment income, et cetera. Lastly, and unfortunately, discrimination. Some newcomers may experience discrimination when seeking rental accommodations due to their ethnicity, race, or religion. When it comes to insurance, newcomers struggle due to a lack of Canadian insurance history. Newcomers most likely will not have any Canadian insurance history, which can result in higher premiums or difficulty in obtaining certain types of insurance. Language barriers. The language barriers can make it challenging to understand the coverage offered by insurance policies and difficulty in getting coverage. Newcomers may have difficulty getting coverage for certain types of insurance, such as auto insurance, due to their lack of Canadian driving experience. On the banking front, they face challenges such as limited credit history. Having recently arrived in the, new, in the country, newcomers haven't had the time to develop Canadian credit history, which is the backbone of our financial system. By not having established credit history here in Canada, it can make accessing bank services such as loans or credit cards extremely difficult. Sometimes they have difficulty opening an account. Newcomers can also face challenges in opening a bank account due to a lack of Canadian identification or proof of address. Limited access to financial resources and information. Newcomers may also be unaware of financial resources that are available to them, such as low interest loans or government programs. Overall, newcomers face several challenges when it comes to housing, insurance, and banking. These challenges can be particularly daunting for those who are unfamiliar with the Canadian system and its requirements. However, with patience, perseverance, and the right support, newcomers can successfully navigate these challenges and settle into their new lives in Canada. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about open banking. So what is it, how does it work, and how is it currently being utilized globally? After we discuss open banking, we're going to talk about how it's being utilized to help newcomers access the products and services they need here in Canada. So what is open banking? Open banking is a system in which banks and financial institutions allow third-party providers to access their customers' financial data through application pro programming interfaces. I know what you're thinking, it sounds very simple. Open banking allows customers to securely share their information with other banks, financial institutions, or third-party providers, such as budgeting apps or investment services. Open banking aims to promote innovation and competition in the financial sector by allowing customers to access a wider range of services, products, and financial advice. It also enables customers to compare financial products more easily and switch between providers more efficiently, as their financial data can be shared across institutions. Open banking is regulated and governed by national authorities, such as the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK and the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions in Canada. These authorities set standards for data protection, security, and privacy to ensure the customer's financial information is protected. Overall, open banking has the potential to transform the financial industry by giving customers greater control over their financial data and empowering them to make informed decisions about their finances. Lastly, the transferability of data globally will empower newcomers to remove the starting from scratch like experience when coming to Canada. You now have the power to you now have the power to bring your data with you in the form of a risk profile, almost like a financial passport, which helps to provide financial stability and creditworthiness to Canadian service providers. Utilize the data you've spent years building and sorry, and utilize the data you've spent years in your home country building. So let's talk about how open banking works now. So open banking works by allowing banks and financial institutions to share their customers financial information with third party providers through secure digital channels known as APIs. The customer has control over their data and can choose which third party providers they want to share their data with. When a customer consents to share their data with a third party provider, the bank or financial institution securely shares the customer's data with a third party provider through an API. This data might include information such as account balances, transaction histories, and spending patterns. The third party provider can then use this data to offer the customer a range of customized services, such as budgeting apps, investment advice, or loan products. Overall, open banking aims to promote innovation 
and competition in the financial industry by enabling customers to access a wider range of financial services, products, and advice. By allowing customers to share their data with third-party providers, open banking gives customers more control over their financial information and the ability to make more informed decisions about their finances. So now I wanted to showcase a couple examples as to what um, third-party providers look like. So on the left-hand side of the screen here, you're seeing an example of a risk profile in which would be utilized for an individual that's relocating internationally. So for example, Rose relocated from Brazil in which she uploaded her financial data uh, to Vambora from Brazil. So when she gets to Canada, she can leverage that data to showcase her financial stability, to showcase her credit worthiness by showing her uh, income confirmations in the home country, her proof of funds, her savings that she's developed, uh, her debt exposure, what her uh, monthly obligations look like for any debt facilities that she has outstanding. She's also able to do her identity verification. So she is able to prove that she is who she said she says she is, as well as she's not on any um, fraud detection lists as well. So it confirms that the service provider here domestically knows who that knows um, they're dealing with the person who they say they are, and they also are able to assess um, their financial stability and their credit worthiness through the data they've built in, uh, in the home country. And in this case, it's Brazil. On the right-hand side, you're seeing an example of a personal financial management application here in Canada. So this application uh, enables consumers to amalgamate their banking in one place. So on average, they say that Canadians uh, bank in between, I think in around three institutions per person. So if you have an application in which you can pull all of your banking into one place, it helps you to give a snapshot view as to your financial health in a holistic view where you can see everything in one place and, and better manage your finances. So those are two examples of, of uh, open banking third-party providers that are available. So now we're going to talk a little bit about open banking. Uh, we're going to travel around the world and, and uh, look at a few different use cases here. So we're going to start in... Australia with insurance. So uh, Australia uh, had open banking. It was officially launched in July of 2020 with four major banks. So Commonwealth Bank, Westpac, ANZ, and National Australia Bank, which means those institutions are required to share their data with accredited third parties. By February 2022, there were over 300 financial institutions that were accredited to access open banking data in Australia. In Australia, insurance providers are utilizing open banking to make underwriting decisions by accessing bank data through APIs to better assess the risk of potential policyholders. Open banking allows for the sharing of financial information between banks and other financial institutions with the consent of the customer, which is known as consumer permissioned data. By integrating with open banking APIs, insurance providers can retrieve data such as account transactions, savings patterns, and payment history, which can give them a more complete picture of an applicant's financial situation. This information can then be used to determine the applicant's ability to pay premiums and make more informed decisions about underwriting. In Brazil, in February, on February 1st of 2021, the Brazilian financial industry launched open banking, marking the beginning of a new era in data sharing. In the initial phase, over 2 million Brazilians shared their credit history and personal information with more than 2,400 participating financial institutions. According to a Centro's survey, 74% of Brazilian consumers are willing to share their financial information to access personalized and relevant financial services. Open banking is transforming the underwriting process for potential borrowers in Brazil by using APIs to access bank data and account data financial institutions are now better able to evaluate an individual's credit worthiness. With open banking, customers can share their financial information between banks and other financial institutions, giving lenders a more complete picture of their financial uh, situation. And lastly, we're going to look at housing in the UK. So in 2018, the UK officially launched open banking, aiming to increase competition and innovation in the financial sector. Today, over 300 regulated entities are enrolled in open banking with more than 3 million active users accessing open banking enabled products and services. According to a recent report by Allied Market Research, the UK's open banking market is expected to grow at an annual compound growth rate of 24.4% between 2021 and 2028, 
reaching a market size of almost $5 billion by 2028. In the UK, property management companies are now utilizing open banking to streamline their tenant screening and underwriting process. By using APIs to access bank data, these companies can now make informed decisions on potential tenants. Through integration with open banking APIs, property management companies can retrieve information such as a bank account transactions, payments, and bank balances. This data can provide a comprehensive overview of a tenant's financial situation, allowing for better assessment of their ability to pay rent and other bills on time, as well as evaluating their creditworthiness. The use of open banking in the tenant screening process is more efficient, faster, and more secure than traditional methods, such as credit checks, which can be unreliable, expensive, and time-consuming. With open banking data updated real-time, property management companies can make quicker and more informed decisions on potential tenants. So you're probably all wondering what is happening with open banking in Canada and how does this affect me? Well, open banking in Canada is on the horizon with an anticipated formal rollout coming in 2023. With that being said, open banking is already starting to be utilized here domestically, especially for newcomers, since they're able to provide open banking data from their origin country if open banking is in effect there, which makes it much easier for them to present their creditworthiness to service providers here in Canada. To date, the Government of Canada has updated the public via phase announcements. So for phase one, the Government of Canada review Oh, sorry, the Government of Canada's review of open banking was released, and this happened in early 2020, which proposed that the industry and government collaborate to develop a framework that would enable safe introduction of open banking in Canada based on stakeholder consultations and learnings from other, jurisdic or other jurisdictions. In phase two, involves further stakeholder consultations on a proposed open banking framework for Canada, including the financial consumer agencies of Canada's advice on designing the framework to best ensure consumer protection, which led to the committee delivering its findings in a final report to the Minister of Finance in April of 2021. The report provided the minister with recommendations on implementing a secure open banking framework in Canada. In phase three, which began in March of 2022, with the appointment of Abraham Tachian to lead the development of an open banking framework in Canada with a mandate to consult the industries, or the, sorry, the industry regulators and consumer representatives to design and implement the key elements of an open banking framework. The Canadian government has been exploring the possibility of implementing open banking since, 2020, or since 2018. As of now, open banking is not yet regulated in Canada and is not widely available to consumers. With that being said, we are seeing the adoption of open banking directly benefiting new to Canada consumers, as information from global, bank, global open banking sources has helped to bridge the visibility barriers between new immigrants and service providers here in Canada. We'll discuss this in more depth in the slides to come. The Government of Canada and the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions are responsible for overseeing and regulating the financial industry in Canada. The government and regulators are currently working together to develop a regulatory framework for open banking that protects consumers while encouraging innovation and competition in the financial sector. The Canadian government has expressed its commitment to protecting consumer privacy and data security in the development of the open banking framework. Overall, the Canadian government and regulators are taking a cautious approach to the implementation of open banking, with a focus on ensuring consumer protection and privacy. While the regulatory framework is still under development, there is a growing momentum in the industry to embrace open banking as a means to improve access to financial products and services for newcomers and other underserved communities. So let's talk about how open banking can disrupt the financial system in Canada. For one, open banking can introduce competition and innovation to the financial system in Canada by allowing new players, such as fintechs, to offer financial products and services. Two, open banking can promote transparency and interoperability by providing consumers with greater control over their financial data and enabling them to share it securely with third-party providers. And three, by enabling data-driven insights, and customized financial solutions, open banking has the potential to transform the way financial services are delivered in Canada. 
how open banking will create accessibility for newcomers. So open banking can reduce the barriers faced by newcomers in accessing financial products and services by enabling them to share their financial data from their home country with lenders, insurance, insurers, and other financial service providers more easily. For example, when applying for a mortgage, newcomers often face challenges in proving their creditworthiness to lenders. With open banking, newcomers can provide lenders with access to their financial data, including payment histories and other credit-related information to demonstrate their creditworthiness and improve their chances of securing a mortgage. Open banking can also provide a more comprehensive view of their financial situation, which enables service providers to make more informed decisions and offer more suitable products. In this way, open banking can help to promote financial inclusion and empower newcomers with greater access to products and services they need to succeed in Canada. Overall, open banking has the potential to disrupt the current financial system in Canada by introducing competition, competition promoting transparency, and enabling data-driven insights and customized financial solutions. Additionally, it can create accessibility for newcomers in Canada by reducing the barriers they face in accessing, in accessing financial products and services, promoting financial inclusion and economic growth. So I've been talking a lot. I'm going to pass it over to my first industry expert now. Uh, my first industry expert is going to talk, uh, or sorry, First, it's Tyler from the housing sector. Tyler's gonna to talk to us today about the application process, uh, general requirements for an application, current challenges he sees when um, assessing newcomer lease applications and the opportunity that open banking presents. So I'll pass it over to you, Tyler. Thank you. Um, that's yeah, 30 minutes is a long time to go, um, effectively on one breath, and yeah. Big ups for your stamina there. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the rental industry primarily, uh, not necessarily mortgages. Um, and we're going to start by discussing how we look at um, applications traditionally uh, in the existing system. Um, so the, the three main things we look at uh, when, when processing lease or rental applications are income, credit score, and, and rental history. Um, Income is usually in the form of, you know, job letter, pay stub, C4, things like that. Any way to verify um, income. Uh, credit, I mean, standard credit score, Equifax, TransUnion. Um, you know, we're not necessarily looking for a minimum number per se, but consistency of payments is, is key. Uh, and then rental history, um, you know, at the moment, credit scores don't show that. Um, that needs to be manually verified with landlord checks. Um, newcomers to Canada do face challenges in all three of these uh, categories, whether they are um, landed already or, or looking to come. Um, starting with income, um, if they are you know, on their way to or, or pending arrival, they you know, will not be able to show that um, you know, in, in the traditionally accepted methods. Uh, credit score, I mean, they will largely not have that either if they're you know, coming from abroad and rental history. Um, again, it's very difficult to show or follow up. Um, and then we're adding on top of all of that, the language barrier. And that makes each one of those uh, categories uh, even harder to, to go through and, and, and properly evaluate. So how does open banking help with all of those things? It's, it's almost hard to believe how how wonderfully equitable it makes it almost right away. It solves so many of these problems with, with one system. Um, you know, starting with the traditional credit score. Well, what are we looking for in credit score? We're looking for, you know, consistent, not missing any payments. And with open banking, we can do that. We can see exactly what they've paid, um, the consistency of that, have they missed anything? Um, and, and how much are they carrying versus their income? On that, we can also see their income, right? One of the things we look for is, do they make what they say they make, where they say they make it? And, and with open banking, we can see all of those things. It's very transparent um, and, and it's verifiable. And that's phenomenal. Rental history, again, this is something that traditionally is difficult for domestic applicants. We would have to make that actual call. And I, I don't know about anyone else in this industry. It's 
often difficult to to do rental history checks uh, internationally. Again, and you're adding the language barrier on top of that, making it even harder. With open banking, uh, we are able to see that they have paid their rent on time every month, and more than that exactly on the day of you know is is it a couple of days late here's a couple of days late there those those little details matter uh, and we want to be able to give new canadians the best chance they possibly can mark was talking about discrimination and i'm, I'm sure it's unintentional a lot of the time but it it's a serious thing where new canadians are not being given the same the same chance as everybody else through no fault of anybody's but the system and with open banking um, the playing field is able to be leveled very quickly um, and we have, we're giving everybody the tools to, you know, do the most thorough job that they can. Um, I kind of rushed all my notes on that one. That's all right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the uh, the insight from the side of property management companies. I know it's been a, a changing landscape over the last few years as we continuously see more and more newcomers arrive in the country and our um, you know, supply tends to be on on the go uh, moving in the opposite direction. So we want to make sure that everyone has a uh, you know a, a fair chance here in the country. I know that was one of the the biggest things that jumped out to you when you started to kind of work with uh, with op open banking and incorporating that in part of your process there. Um, but yeah, I think it's very very important to make sure that everybody has uh, an equal chance here when they when they come to Canada. So um, from there, I'm going to pass it over to Nigel from Neo Financial. So I know I, was, I, I plugged Nigel a little earlier on in the presentation, so I'm excited to kind of hear uh, what he's got to share with us today. Uh, so Nigel's going to be talking about the, the steps that Neo is taking to ensure banking is more accessible for new Canadians and how they can support you in your relocation process as well. Get it. Um, this is great. Glad to put this together. And absolutely, open banking is going to be and so critical to the future of banking in Canada. So along those lines, um, yeah, so I work for Neo Financial and at Neo, we are, what we doing, or what we're calling reimagining banking in Canada. And a huge part of that equation is innovating on how newcomers get set up with the financial services they need before they arrive in their new home country. As it stands today, a few of the big five banks enable newcomers to start the process of creating the financial products they need pre-arrival. This would include things like a bank account and a credit card. However, while you can create these products, they're not they don't actually have the systems and processes in place to be able to activate them um, until the newcomer arrives in Canada. And not only that, once the newcomer comes to Canada, they then have to go in person to a branch to activate the product. So this really limits the value of the products to newcomers because they can't use them to set up the other essentials they need. So, you know, like uh, Tyler just discussed with setting up renting, um, you know, can you have those products in place before you arrive to set that up? Um, and then, of course, once you do arrive, you're reliant on cash until you can get to a local bank branch. And at least the newcomers I've spoken to, nobody really wants to touch down in a new country where you don't really know where everything is with, you know, $9,999 in their pocket. So enter NEO. This is, you know, a problem that we really think needs a solution. So NEO is uniquely positioned to tackle the challenge of putting functional financial service products in the hands of newcomers before they arrive in Canada because of the distinct fashion in which our technology was designed. So unlike traditional banks where everything has to funnel through what's called a banking ledger, which is highly regulated, NEO has two ledgers. So we have a banking ledger and then a tech ledger that sits on top. And this is really powered by this whole con, the constructs of open banking. And because of this sophisticated construct, we can enable individuals to create, activate, and use the financial products they need before they get here. So with Neo, a newcomer can create an account, fund it, and access it via prepaid uh, MasterCard, all while still in their home country. And they can then use this MasterCard to set up their telecommunications, rent, utilities, et cetera. So not to mention when they get off the plane and take the first step of their Canadian journey, they can have that penultimate Canadian moment where they walk straight over to Tim Hortons, grab, pay for a coffee with their card before they leave the airport. So why does this matter? I mean, that's simple. It makes the newcomer journey easier, friendlier, quite frankly, safer and better. And um, that's what we're doing at NEO. So thanks, Mark, for having me today. And I'm excited to uh, talk about this exciting uh, new product suite that we're bringing to market.
Absolutely. I appreciate the input there. And that's, uh, I don't know if there's a more formal stamp of approval than a, than a cup of Tim Hortons coffee when you get to Canada to uh, solidify your, your, uh, your, new, uh, your new home. Exactly. So yeah, <laughs> thanks so much, Nigel. And now I wanted to pass it over to Eric from Single Key. So Eric's going to be discussing a very unique product that they actually have available, uh, how that's making housing more accessible for newcomers, especially first generation immigrants with no network here in Canada. So thank you very much, Eric, and it's all yours, man. Awesome. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. This is great. Uh, great opportunity to to talk to you, uh, to you all. Um, essentially, we kind of at Single Key, our whole role here is to help mitigate a lot of the risk for landlords uh, and tenants and newcomers. We kind of tackle a bit upon some stuff that Tyler said um, and Nigel in the sense that you know Tyler did a good job explaining what needs to be done, how open banking helps. And what we come in is we kind of add a little extra. So we've seen the newcomers here when they come in. Uh, given no credit score, a lot of missing information that's usually North American focused and landlords, uh, landlords tend to uh, discount. And to offset some of the risk of not having this information, landlords tend to ask for deposits or you know six months worth of rent uh, right away, which makes it a lot harder for, for newcomers to come in. So there's a lot of barriers for newcomers to, to come in when landlords do accept some of that risk, right? And so what single key does is with open banking which is going to be paramount uh, all we need is a few pieces of information from newcomers and that would be no uh, bankruptcies and we just want to verify uh, some of the income that you have and the amount of the lease so we can have a nice ratio and what single key does is we actually become your guarantor uh, it's called a tenant passport as for people who come in who know they don't have that information when they come to the country um, given open banking, we can approve them. We can issue them a, a tenant passport. And what that does is that when you then go and see, find uh, your rental units or property managers like Tyler, you can actually say, listen, I do have a guarantor here in the country who will, that now eliminates a lot of the risk for the decision-making of having you uh, and giving you uh, the appropriate housing. And so that's something that's very important to us. It's part of our, our current program called the Rent Guarantee Program, which is on top of the tenant passport. And what we do is we further eliminate some of the risk for the landlords by guaranteeing that should something happen with payments in the future, uh, we would help cover a lot of that for the tenant. And so all of this is just to say single key, once you come in with open banking, if we issue you a tenant passport, we are there to help you find it, find the place and we'll help you get guaranteed, eliminate a lot of the risk and let the landlords know that they have nothing to fear, uh, nothing to worry about by issuing this. And our goal here is to make it a lot easier for newcomers to find uh, appropriate housing uh, in the country. And so I don't want to take too much of your time, but here at Single Key, that's what we do. We want to eliminate the risk for everyone and especially make it easier for people to find uh, appropriate housing. So thanks, Mark, for having me. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks so much, Eric. I think that's uh, such a great product that you guys have there. I know that it's um, you know, not something that just, um, you know, newcomers potentially have a need for, but there's even domestic usage for it as well. Like for individuals that maybe work in the, uh, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, but maybe people that work in the restaurant business that earn a lot in tips and on paper, their income doesn't show a whole lot, but they know that they can pay for a certain apartment, which would often require a guarantor to sign for them. So it's, it's neat to see the, uh, the flexibility in the offering there and especially how it's helping newcomers with their relocation. Absolutely. So that is uh is all for today so i know that uh i had some polls scheduled that i cruised right through with my 30 minute uh, spiel there so uh if they wanted to put the polls out to um our today's audience that would be greatly appreciated and we can get some responses there and then we can open it up for the q a as well very interesting have a very diverse group here today it looks like um the uh, close to 70% of people experienced a uh, difficulty for reasons in which we uh, had expected credit references being the two primary issues there, um, as well as a mixed bag for people that have uh, understanding about open banking. So I know there was a couple more polls if you want to release those last two now, and then we can open it up to the Q&A. Got to unmute myself before I talk here. So then just, just reviewing some of the polls, and it's very interesting to see that, um, you know, over, well, again, close to 70% of today's audience relocated to the country 
uh, from a country that doesn't have a traditional credit rating system in place. So when you come to a country like Canada, where uh, you know a credit system is really the backbone of our financial system, it's screaming the need for adoption when it comes to underwriting practices because the amount of global mobility of people moving in different locations all around the world, uh, it's not apples to apples. However, their needs are apples to apples. When they when they live in a house in one country, they're going to need a house in the other country. Whereas they're moving from a country with a credit rating system and going to one that doesn't, or vice versa. Uh, there's always issues when it comes to underwriting those individuals for the for the um, products and services that they need once they get there. So um, very interesting. And I appreciate you guys taking uh, taking part in the polls today. So uh, we'll open it up for Q&A now. Uh, I know I've kind of answered a few of the questions that have come up throughout today's presentation, but uh, we do have one more. I'm curious to know if if open banking is accessible for those who have language barriers. Could you share your thoughts on this? I'm curious to know if open banking is accessible for those who have language barriers. Um, yes, open banking isn't uh, language dependent. It's really just based off of the um, a few factors would come into play there. So uh, is there open banking in the country in which you're coming from? So um, this one is a bit of an interesting situation because there's countries like um, Brazil, UK, Australia that all have open banking frameworks implemented which means the government has released um, uh, a, regula a, re a regulatory framework as to how it operates in the country. Uh, whereas you have countries like Canada and the US, which actually haven't adopted or implemented any open banking frameworks yet. However, there's still providers here that can provide that same type of solution in which um, they connect individually with the institutions and enable consumers to share their information from those institutions. So when it comes to uh, language barriers being impediment for open banking, um, it's not going to play a, a factor on that, no matter where you come from. As long as there's a plugin for you to access the data via uh, an open banking provider in your home country, um, then you you'll be able to to access open banking there. So, um, for example, in Canada and the States, there's providers like Plaid and Flinks. In Latin America, there's Belvo. Uh, in Southeast Asia, there's Finverse. So there's a multiple different players out there. And those individual players have relationships directly with the institutions. So long story short, if you have a provider in your country that has those relationships with the institution and is able to offer that open banking product, um, then you'll be able to access that. So language won't actually play, uh, play a factor there. Okay, so another question's come in. So um, open banking involves banks sharing and being transparent about customer information. How does this require how does this requirement align with the competition between banks, particularly in terms of attracting customers with competitive products and customer service? So I can put my two cents on this and I'd love to kind of know Nigel's uh, Nigel's contribution as well. So in regards to uh, the banks competing. I'm going to circle back to how information is exchanged. So the, in the case of open banking, anytime financial data is shared on behalf of a customer, it has to be approved or uh, yeah, approved essentially by the customer, which is called consumer permission data. So if I were to go into uh, Neo Financial and I wanted to open an account there and they needed my information, and I currently deal with another institution here in Canada, I would give grant um, permission for NEO to have access to that information in which it would force the other institution to share that information with NEO so that they could do whatever it is that I have come to them requested. So maybe open an account for me or do a credit application for me. Uh, I've given them all my information from the other institution. So when it comes to um, the competition between banks, particularly in terms of attracting customers, I don't see that playing a role, but maybe Nigel wants to add uh, add some more on top of that. 
Yeah, no, uh, Mark, you're exactly right. So really, like, the way we want to think about it is that it's two different buckets. So like, the personal information tied to the client um, is owned by the client. And it, it's, it's, it's like your individual information. Um, and then the banks kind of have access to that if you grant it to them. And they don't have any kind of impact on that data other than like reporting on things like um, credit and do you pay your bills and, and you know, what type, type of loans have you taken out, et cetera. So they're reporting on products that you're accessing and how you use those. And then that is assigned to your, your profile. Um, so there's the competition perspective there, there is no impact. Like what you do individually impacts your profile. And then the banks are effectively looking at that profile and making a decision on um, if the risk of working with you as a client is worth it. Uh, and if it is, then how can we craft products or give you, you know, put things together in a way that is more appealing to you than it is than what some other bank can offer you. So that's more where the competition piece comes in. And that's why you'll see like, um, you know, some of the banks will give you a toaster when you sign up because some people really want a toaster versus, you know, at Neo, we're all, we're really focused on providing free services because we think that's important. So um, yeah, that's, that's the two things. Client data over here, it's its own bucket and then banks over here um, when you give access uh, to that data. Love it. And the only other thing that I wanted to comment on there was just in regards to the actual um, competitive products. You made a note about the competitive products. So uh, I, I showcased uh, another application earlier in today's presentation on the right here, which is uh, a personal financial management tool. So when you amalgamate banking in one place and you share your information with a third party provider like this, or even if your institution starts to incorporate that. So let's say, for example, uh, Neo Financial, their their banking application, they enable you to pull in other banks' information that you have out there so that you can kind of see all of your finances in one place. If Neo had access to all that information, or in this case, if Billy, this Billy app has access to all of your banking information in one place, then they would be able to map out your spending, see what your credit, see what kind of balances you're carrying on your credit facilities, and make... Um, potentially make recommendations that are customized specifically for you based on your financial history. So if you're constantly carrying a high balance on your credit card, they might make a recommendation to you to say, hey, you know, you should explore this debt consolidation loan at uh, Neo Financial, which has a great rate. So they could make recommendations for you based off of seeing your banking in, uh, in a holistic view. Whereas right now it's all siloed. So if you bank at TD or if you bank at Bank of Nova Scotia and you go in there, they only know the, 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 the information that you have there. So any accounts that you have with them, the information pertaining to those, but they don't know any of your banking anywhere else to know how to properly make um, customized recommendations for you because they don't see that full financial picture unless you outright share it with them. So that's the kind of improvements that open banking is going to facilitate. It'll enable consumers to have a better um, grasp of their financial uh, picture and make more informed decisions, hopefully um, leveraging recommendations that are made by third-party providers or banking apps um, from institutions here in Canada that are able to incorporate uh, all of one's information. So I hope that was helpful. Uh, is there any other questions out there? Or did anybody else from our uh, presenters panel want to comment on that one? Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to leave it up. We got another question coming in here. Excellent presentation, everyone. Thank you for sharing your insights. I'm interested to know if you are aware of any challenges that other countries have faced during the implementation of open banking. Could this information be useful in addressing potential obstacles in Canada's adoption of open banking? Um, well, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, challenges that other countries have faced. I'm sure there's been um, issues in at the 
at the forefront of every issue, I'm sure it's consumer privacy. Whenever you're implementing an open banking framework like this, that is always the most important fact is to make sure that consumers are protected and their information is safe. So I'm assuming those are probably the largest issues that have been um, had to be overcome by countries when they're introducing their uh, their open banking framework. And I know that's exactly what Canada is experiencing right now. And that's what uh, what's taking a little bit longer than expected for us to do a rollout is to make sure that consumers are protected at all at all costs. And I know. Um, Sorry, not to pick on you again, Nigel, but I think um, Nigel might have some some uh, um, something to add on this one, just because um, he knows how important it is with consumer privacy at banks to make sure that information is protected. And um, but yeah, I definitely would agree that this information would be helpful in uh, addressing obstacles for us doing an implementation of open banking here domestically. Mark, you're exactly right. The consumer privacy is certainly paramount in this. I think the one really nice thing that Canada has going for it in this circumstance is that um, Australia has has gone through the process and kind of um, learned a lot of the pain points um, and addressed them and come up with a really effective system. Um, so we can mimic, you know, as, as you said at the start of this whole presentation, you know, we've the Canadian government's appointed different people to lead this through. And um, you know, they have a lot of great frameworks around the world uh, um, to, to use as examples. So uh, hopefully everything gets launched here as soon as possible. Yeah, it's, I think you're right. We've got, some, uh, we've got a, a nice amount of guinea pigs here that have kind of set the stage for us. So we just can kind of go in and avoid some of their challenges. And, uh, and hopefully this, this will be implemented. Although I, I did write that uh, component of the presentation today saying that um, we had plans to implement a formal rollout of open banking in 2023, but I did hear that open banking wasn't uh, mentioned in the budget, which is a very bad sign. So it could be 2024, which we see open banking introduced in Canada. So just wanted to be clear on that for everyone. So I'm uh, going to leave this open for about another 30 seconds or so to see if there's any other questions that come in. If not, uh, we'll give you guys some time back and uh, we'll wrap up today's presentation. Well, it doesn't look like there's any other questions coming in now. So um, yeah, we will we'll wrap up there. I'd like to thank everybody else uh, or thank everybody for coming out today and, and uh, joining us for today's presentation. I'd especially like to thank my partners in crime here, Nigel, Eric, Tyler, thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to come and join me here and share your industry insight. I know it's very valuable for today's audience. And um, feel free to, to reach out to us if you guys have any questions or uh, you know just want to pick our brains a little bit more. I know um, there's also been some products here discussed as well. So if you have any interest in learning more about those, you're more than welcome to reach out to today's uh, panel. Um, I haven't listed, um, actually all of our information is available on uh, the Pathways to Prosperity website. So uh, if you're looking for contact information, that would be the best place to go. But other than that, have a great rest of your day. And we look forward to chatting with you soon.